Thank you, Mr Baswell. And I'd also like to thank all the presenters today for what was some very high quality presentations. Thank you. I would now like to uh, open the floor for some questions. Can I ask that, uh, that you raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you if you have a question. Uh, announce your name and company and then keep the, uh, the questions reasonably succinct as we're, we are on a time frame. So is there any questions of the audience for panellists today? While you're thinking, I'll crank this iPad up. I've got a... And it's just come up with a passcode, which I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps there might be someone from IT that can help with that or some questions while we sort the iPad out. Well, I've got a question. Pardon? Can I ask a question? Yep, OK, thank you. Oh, that's the bonus while the hands didn't go up. I've got a question for the Treasurer that I'd be really interested to ask. Given we've heard about the plethora of reviews and inquiries that are going on with the Commonwealth Government, the Commission of Audit, some of these other things. As a state-level you know, level Treasurer, how do you see that, that whole suite of things that are going on coming together uh, into a coherent agenda that you guys can then work with? Yeah. Um, we've been through a whole range of um, potential reform programs with the, with the former government and not much happened, so I'd have to say you get a bit sceptical. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's actually an intent, and one of the things we're really keen on with this process is to clarify uh, this issue around who has responsibility for what. And you raised it uh, when you presented, and Marine, I think it's probably the most important thing we have to do. Who has responsibility for what? So we don't spend all our time arguing about, you know, whose who's paddock that's in, and actually focus on doing the job properly. And it's a really big issue. Uh, I, my personal view is, I, like I have a background in local government. I think there's actually some really good things that local government should be doing. Uh, there's some things they shouldn't be doing. There's a good space for state government and there's a good space for the federal government. And one thing we should stop doing is wasting all our time worrying about everybody else and do what we're paid to do. So I'm hopeful we'll get some reform. I think it's in, I'll get some clarification uh, in this space because I think it's really, really important. Thanks for starting that off, Amory. Anyone else from the floor? Over here. Thanks very much. Uh, this is Tim Shanahan from the University of Western Australia. Um, this one's to the Treasurer. I don't know um, if I've heard in recent years a presentation from the WA Treasurer that hasn't mentioned GST share. Um, perhaps I missed it in your presentation. Um, given the ch structural changes in our economy that you've alluded to, would you like to speculate on the implications for Western Australia in its GST share? Uh, my staff said to me, you should talk about GST, and I said, I think Tim will be there, so he'll probably get up and ask the, the question. Um, look, I, I could have talked about it, but, geez, we've, we've been bumping on about it for forever. Um, and I get a bit sick of talking about it, and I think people get a bit sick of listening it, to it, but it is an issue. Um, how, how would I put it? Uh, we have 11% of the nation's population. We probably pay a little bit more than 11% of the total GST because of the wealth differential. Maybe, maybe not, but I think we probably do. Um, in four years' time, if nothing changes, so you've got this big pie of GST money, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 billion dollars. In four years' time, we'll get less, or around 1% of it back. So 11% of the population will get 1% of the GST pie back. In nominal value, WA, with 10% or with 10 times the population and 10 times the economy of the Northern Territory, will get less money than the Northern Territory. So it's a really difficult issue. Um, we, so th there's a, th that's the issue. Uh, the second issue is how do we progress reform or, or change in that space? Th that's really, really hard because uh, we go off to the meetings and um, certain states that are, you know, who, who do well out of the GST just flat out refuse to have anything to do with it. So we've set up a process with what we call the donor states, Queensland, uh, Victoria, New South Wales and us because eventually they move in and out of being a donor state. Uh, and we're looking at what we can do to... Um, uh, to make some changes. Uh, it's been slow. Uh, we have a very uh, small but important point of leverage at the moment. The other states want to uh, put, um, what do they call it, GST onto online purchases. Uh, that won't happen in WA because my Chief of Staff, Rachel, is a very heavy online consumer. <laughs> and if you know her, you don't want to upset her. So that's, uh, that's good sound public policy development. Um, and I'm happy to state that publicly. 
No, look, what it is, it's a point of leverage for us. And why would we, you know, I keep saying to them, if you want to talk about GST, let's do it all. We, if we're going to talk about a little bit, 1% um, of whatever they get is worth nothing to us. And in actual fact, on that front, the business case is yet to prove there's going to be any money left after you pay for everyone to collect the GST. And I actually don't think it will. So we'll work through that. But So we're, we're frantically looking for any point of leverage. You know, we have some models that we, we're sort of proposing, um, but it, it, you know, no one's rushing to the, join us at the table, Tim. I think, if I may, you know, this is sort of was partly motivated my question. We've got the white paper on federal-state relations, we've got the National Commission of Audit, we've got the mooted tax review and reform. There's, there's, there's the fragmentation of the process, I guess, that's going to be quite problematic because all those, the complexity and interdependence of those issues is so great. Um, I and mean, really, in a process sense, it's, it's quite difficult to think about how you design one that would allow you to get to. I mean, can I just have one last of little go? I mean, one of the problems is, I mean, we've been through three tax review processes. I think we had Henry, we had uh, the GST distribution panel. Like, like, like every few years, someone thinks we've, we've got a bit of an issue. We'll have a review, and nothing. And there'd be more from previously. So, the the problem is, unless you have prepared to review the totality of the tax system and the GST distribution system that sits off that, you're never going to get anything done. Because at the end of the day, you're, you'll always have vested interests that don't agree for change. So. It's a tad frustrating, just to, because I wrote this number down because I knew you were coming, Tim. If we got our fair whack, in, over the next four years, we'd have $21.1 billion more. Now, with $21.1 billion, we could fund a few more things, we could pay off some debt, and we'd all be very happy. Uh, table 10, actually, down here. Peter Kennedy from uh, Business News, Mr. Buswell. <laughs> I'd like to follow up uh, a point Mike Smith made, actually, when he talked about payroll tax. And he talked about the negative uh, impact that payroll tax had. And he sort of, again, raised the question, what's a payroll tax doing, a tax on jobs, doing as a major fundraiser for the states? Now, is there any chance of... of uh, you talked about an increase in the payroll tax threshold, which some businesses will welcome, but is there any chance, given the tax review or whatever, of payroll tax disappearing? Uh, would the state government consider giving up payroll tax in uh, favour of some other major tax which would uh, be redistributed? Yeah. Uh, look, it's a really good question, Peter. We, we, uh, in our submission to the Henry Tax Review, which is, I can't remember that it was 2009 or 2010, we suggested that... Um, if we were able to, with a no net tax increase, it would be you would be able to rearrange the Australian tax system if you were prepared to look at the rate of GST. Uh, and what that would mean, for example, is that states could get rid of all their remaining taxes because all our taxes, payroll tax, um, stamp duty on property transactions, land tax, they're all very inefficient economic taxes, narrow base, expensive to, uh, to administer, expensive to comply with, everything you don't want in a tax, they are. Uh, and it would be much better, there would be a very strong argument from in terms of uh, productivity and national economic growth to say if you get rid of all of those and pick that decline in revenues up somewhere else, then that's a good outcome. Uh, and then, of course, you'd have to have a mechanism to compensate the states. Um, but that, that can be done. I mean, in, in some models, for example, uh, in Canada, uh, some of the provinces, or all the provinces, have access to a portion of the income tax spectrum. There's a whole range of things you could do. And it might also give us the opportunity to um, reduce reliance on Commonwealth grants and increase reliance on taxation revenue. And why that's important is while we only raise a small proportion of our total expenditure through taxation, there's, there's a disconnect between your tax effort and spending. And I reckon one of the reasons states spend too much money is you don't get penalised by having to put taxes up when you're lazy with money. Uh, there's a strong political uh, imperative to be wiser stewards of money if you have to put taxes up if you go over the, over the odds. That doesn't exist at the moment. So I, I think it's a, a really important area for reform. My hope is that in the next term of of the federal government that they look at tackling these sorts of issues. I mean, I understand that politically it's off the table now, but it is a really uh, important area of national economic reform. 
Great. We have a question from the right-hand side of the room. Hi, I have a uh, question for the treasurer. This is Trenton McNee from Down Infrastructure. Um, I'm touching on Mike Smith of ANZ's point earlier regarding attracting entrepreneurs and improving the technology sector. Uh, for example, I know that our broadband speed is up to 25 to 30 times slower than that of South Korea, who is a worldwide leader. And given our habit has um, failed to, well, given that Abbott is going to continue to improve the copper wire infrastructure and not going to improve the um, MBN broadband, um, I'm just wondering what your views are on that. If we should continue to improve the copper wire infrastructure or if we should um, oh, oh, build a new MBN. I'm going to have to be serious. If I answer my phone, I'm having a good day. Okay, when it comes to communications, you got the wrong bloke. Um, so unless someone else can answer it, I won't even try. I mean, I just assume you turn it on and you can answer the damn thing, but I can't. I, I don't know. Okay, I, I just, I, I don't have the expertise to even try and answer that. I mean, politics, we can make stuff up and, and you'll say, you idiot. So I'd rather say I don't know and you can still call me an idiot, but it's not going to waste everybody's time. <laughs> but I do know, I do know that, um, that critical infrastructure, or, or that core infrastructure, or um, uh, backbone infrastructure, whether it be a road or the capacity to move data around, is very, very important. And I think it's actually even more important in WA because of the remote nature of the state. Um, so whilst I can't comment specifically on the performance offerings of the alternate NBN, uh, what I can say is that that type of infrastructure is very important to the state. Uh, I did have, for a brief period, the science portfolio. Uh, we did develop um, some state strategies around uh, the delivery of that type of um, infrastructure. Um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, the funding vehicle uh, is, is being delivered at, at a national level. Uh, I mean, and I can recall uh, when they first started rolling out some of the broadband infrastructure. I think we got one of the, we got about the fifth side in WA, which was up to Geraldton. And what interested me out of it was what was driving that, and I think this is a really interesting part of the equation, uh, was uh, the government's desire to invest in the Square Kilometre Array radio telescope project, which at the end of the day, it's nice to be able to look at the stars and do all that stuff, but it's all about moving data around. And uh, uh, so I'm sorry I can't give you a, a technical answer, but I certainly acknowledge the uh, the significance of the issue that you've raised. Great. Question on the front table here. Uh, Nigel Satterley, in, to try and boost tourism jobs for young people and uh, also uh, more part-time jobs, it's good to see that we've got the sponsors from the Perth Airport. How long before or how much longer do we have to wait for A380s to be able to operate an air bridge out of Perth Airport? Uh, we'd all like to know what the update news is. Brad and Fiona are here, so it'd be good that I think we all want to know how long before we can catch up to other states in Australia. That, that's a question coming from a person who spends a lot of time in first class, Brad. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can carry your skis and your champagne in the overhead locker. <laughs> You're breaking new ground, Nigel, asking a non-panellist a question, but I'm happy to answer it. As of November last year, we have an aero bridge that takes A380s. Um, so the airport, the airfield has been for a number of years capable of taking A380s and we've had them to the airport. We now have the aero bridge and the construction that we have underway now creates the free seating and departure lounges for aircraft of that volume. So technically the aircraft can come tomorrow. It's now a decision for each of the airlines.